Okay, so as always, uh, Craig, it's such an honor to be in the space with you. We really appreciate all the leadership, everything that you've done for our community. Um, but as always, we begin all things by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So that being said, Craig, can you please introduce yourself to our viewers and listeners? Yeah, I mean, uh, Craig Wellington, Executive Director of Black Opportunity Fund, very humbled to be in this space with, with, with you. Um, um, Black Opportunity Fund, a national registered charitable organization that's focused on dismantling barriers um, of the, that are preventing social economic empowerment of Black Canadian communities. So we are laser-like focused on supporting Black-led entrepreneurs as well as Black-led not-for-profits and charities and deploying needs-informed capital. So my, my background uh, it goes back years in terms of community working for various community organizations, um, various not-for-profit leadership uh, organizations, where I've also worked with all, all three levels of government, corporate Canada, uh, you name it, but always along the line, I've had this advocacy role in, with community, especially in education system, criminal justice, and uh, it's always been a passion of, of mine. And this organization and this role I'm in allows me to bring all of those pieces together and, and hopefully uh, for generational impact. Exactly. Amazing. And if you could just tell us a bit more about the remarkable leadership and your work that spans for decades across Canada. I mean, my introduction to advocacy, uh, community advocacy started pretty early in my time in Canada. So I migrated with my family here uh, to Canada from Jamaica, um, middle of grade nine. And by the time I was 19 and in, in university here, um, I, I, I paid for my undergrad degree by suing Square One Shopping Mall in Mississauga, which was at, at the time the largest shopping mall in Ontario for racial harassment. Um, and we recognized with some of my friends that we were, you know, black youth were being targeted by malls across across Canada, youth, but in, in particular, and they were exploiting the Trespass to Property Act. So I successfully sued them because I didn't know any better. I didn't know that an immigrant kid with, with no money can't sue a multi-billion dollar corporation and win. So because I didn't know better, I just went ahead and did it. So I sued them as well as their, their uh, security company. But recognizing even then that this was not just about me as an individual, that this was a systemic issue. So again, we took that to the Ontario Human Rights Commission. So we reached out to Alvin Curling, um, a member of provincial parliament who was one of the most prominent black politicians around. And, and he made the introduction for us to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and they provided, um, they, they, they catalyzed the report, which showed the depth of this issue. And out of that, the Trespass to Property Act was actually changed. So immediately recognizing that an individual can have the ability to make policy change. And then I became very much involved in struggle and was being pulled in to issues around police violence, uh, the Lester Donaldson situation, um, uh, disabled um, black immigrant in his home who was shot to death by Toronto police while sitting in his bed uh, eating his supper. I sat in the trial of the police during that that, that um, during that um, that that incident, uh, where all all of the police were exonerated. I sat there with elders Charles Roach, Sharona Hall. Um, Dudley Laws, who were mentors of mine, Darry Mead, um, and I became very actively engaged. Uh, so very disillusioned in the justice system here. 
uh, and quickly recognized that um, the role that needed to be played in, in advocacy. And I became very much involved. So it's always been a, a, a part and parcel of what I have done. And I've played various advocacy roles with various community, community organizations, um, regardless of where my career roles were. I've always had that, that piece of the community advocacy all the way along. Amazing. And I apologize. Yeah, it is chippy, yeah, but I find when I take my camera off, you're totally smooth. So <laughs> well, I have to keep my camera off there. And I'm downtown Toronto. Can you believe it? So I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm by the CNE. Maybe something's going on. I don't know. All right. <laughs> okay. Can you share a bit about the development of the Black Opportunities Fund? Yeah. Black Opportunity Fund the genesis of the Black Opportunity Fund, interestingly, started prior to the George Floyd um, Global Awakening. So it was about 150 very accomplished Black professionals um, through, throughout a range of, of, of um, genres and industries and so on um, from across Canada came together to brainstorm and figure out what can we do with the accomplishments we have, with the networks we have, with the resources we have uh, to be able to catalyze long-term change for Black communities, in particular ar around access, access to, to capital, opportunities for economic growth. And they were brainstorming a range of things well, uh, with extensive community engagement. Um, and the engagements are about 8,000 um, separate community engagements across Canada. And then the George Floyd incident happened. And of course, we've seen these types of incidents before. Uh, George Floyd wasn't the first uh, black person we've seen killed on, on, on camera by US police. Um, he wasn't even the first that month and he wasn't even the last of that month. But what, what changed in this scenario was the global pandemic and the, the laser-like focus around the world concentrated on that incident. Um, people locked in, in particular students, that th there was that, that pressure buildup that erupted. And the group of individuals then who were gathering together around this, this principle looked at this and said, wait, wait a minute, this is a sustained movement. And they quickly executed and catalyzed and developed this organization and developed a brilliant vision, which is artic articulated in our 100-day in plan, uh, which was developed by the uh, the steering committee of Black Opportunity Fund, as well as McKinsey, which is posted on our website, which is a 10-year strategy for social economic empowerment, which identified core pillars, including children and youth, in, um, education, including women and gender, including entrepreneurship, including arts and culture and recreation, health, criminal justice, um, and they, they mapped out strategies for it. And for example, one of the strategies that they mapped out was the creation of a Black-led philanthropic endowment fund, an 800 million Black-led philanthropic endowment fund, which was part of uh, the advocacy to government, the creation of that. And, and, and SB, uh, SBCC and Governor rep represented have made it clear that the philanthropic endowment fund that eventually was deployed, even though it was not the sustainable number that we had advocated for, was actually built on the framework that was developed by Black Opportunity Fund. So what we have done is we have now, I was brought in two and a half years ago to operationalize this brilliant vision. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've accomplished uh, significant um, things with the investments we've had. And we, we've launched a lending program for Black entrepreneurs who've been declined lending by the uh, the banking institutions, and we've extended that to in, in, include Black entrepreneurs who've been declined lending by the Face Coalition. We've, um, you know, we've we've offered um, training and capacity building support for for over one thousand Black entrepreneurs. We've deployed, um, you know, over two million dollars. Uh, to support just in the last year, Black-led not-for-profits and charities and uh, Black entrepreneurs. Uh, we've provided um, over a million dollars in funding just the last year 
to Black-led not-for-profits and charities. We're doing important work in terms of education, health, criminal justice. Uh, we've, we've established uh, an endowment fund for children and families being treated at SickKids Hospital for the sickle cell disease. And we've funded the development of a technology uh, for safe treatment of children being treated for sickle cell disease at their homes that we have made available over the next five years free of charge to every child in Canada being treated for sickle cell disease, which of course disproportionately impacts those of, of African descent. We are currently building out the structure to launch a $50 million venture capital fund that will take equity stakes in Black-led businesses, as well as a fund of funds to fund other Black-led VCs. So there's a number of innovative initiatives that we are doing, which is you know, pushing the envelope. I think one of, one of the key principles is that in terms of dismantling the long-standing systemic barriers to socioeconomic improvement uh, for Black communities, we can't just replicate the same traditional systemic racist structures and just put a black face to it. It's important that the, the, the strategies that are used are different, that they're innovative, that they're needs informed, that they are informed by community. And that is something that we're extremely pleased to do. And we're pleased to, at the level of engagement um, that we do with community that is done at a transparent level. I mean, we have ongoing town halls with community where we, you know, we open up the floor and we take every question. We answer every question from community and we will continue to do that. So we're pleased of, of where we where we are, um, but lots more to come. Wow. Amazing. My goodness. It's so needed. You know, this is a lot of things that need to be uncovered, especially in our community. A lot of things that is not being spoken about, but with somebody as, as, as magnificent and as powerful as you can really make a difference in our community. It's so commendable. Um, and can you articulate your personal mission and vision for me? Well, I mean, my mission is, is, is always being about equity, right? I, I've always championed equity. For whenever I see inequity, I, I, I stand up against it, regardless of, 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 of which group it is. Because uh, if, if any group uh, is prevented from uh, achieving their potential, it, uh, it impacts all of us. And that's, that's one thing I'm very careful of, is understanding that we all have personal biases, depending on where we come from. We, we live in a, a patriarchal society, so certainly... We live in a society where there are significant inequities, um, in particular to the way women are are are, um, are treated and dis disadvantaged in a number of systemic ways. Uh, so that is something that has always kind of permeated um, what I do in terms of my leadership role, in terms of what we do in terms of our organizations, but recognizing um, barriers uh, you know, the various intersectionalities of, of, of Black communities, recognizing there is no one Black community, there's, there's a multiplicity of identities. And that, again, comes back down to that, that understanding of, 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 of looking in a, in a very wholesome way um, at, the, you know, and, and a broadly human way at, at equity and advancing equity for all. So certainly, it is about taking a focus on um, black, black led, black advancement, black empowerment, but looking at human empowerment as well and equity. So I think that's kind of what what drives me. Um, anytime you, I see inequity in any in any in any situation, I've always in all of my roles, I've always been prepared to stand up to it, regardless of the price um, that uh, that you paid, and I've I've paid a price several times mm -hmm. for that. Yes, yes, for sure. Time to s balance the scales now, right? <laughs> and um, how important is Black empowerment and innovation in your work? That's all of our work, right? I mean, especially at Black Opportunity Fund, that is the core of what we're doing. So understanding we take very seriously our role as stewards of um, the Black community trust. So again, we engage 
community. We have ongoing engagement with Black entrepreneurs, Black leaders, Black community organization. I think it's one of the things that we're very proud of. Um, we have ongoing national tables uh, in, in the areas of our key focus, for example, justice. So we have a national justice working group uh, from across the country with individuals working in that space in a number of different spheres. Um, and we've provided recently our recommendations to the Department of Justice on the Black Canadian justice strategy, for example. We are heavily engaged with our health working group. Again, a table across Canada, which is a unique table that has uh, ongoing discussions around issues uh, in health and social determinants of health impacting Black Canadians um, you know, from right across Canada to ensure that all voices are, are recognized. We've led round tables on the arts and culture ecosystem. We've, we've been involved in discussions about uh, health. So I think, uh, again, everything we do is about that empowerment, that engagement, um, using our platform to ensure we provide a, a voice uh, for Black communities across Canada. Amazing. And um, what inspires you most about your current work? I, I think it is that innovative vision. I mean, I, I was brought into the organization at a, at a time when I think it was still nascent. There was a, a lot of reaction. As I said, we've seen this before um, in terms of the, what we saw around George Floyd, what was different this time is I, I, I think that global point in time where, in, you know, in particular, white communities reacted and finally saw and heard Black people. Um, but we understand that that is a point in time. We understand that for a period of time, Black was in season, as I say, but seasons change and we've already seen the change. So what, we, what is needed is ongoing strategies to be for sustainable change that survives this, this point in time, this spike. And, and what I like about Black Opportunity Fund is that broad vision that we have of innovative solutions uh, to this issue with multiple prongs. And because of that, we have been able to attract significant investment, new investment into the work that we do that is being done in a way that is you know, more sustainable than any organization that has been formed in a reaction. I mean, when you think about it, all the things that we've been able to do to date, we have, not done, we have done that without any significant investment by government to date, um, which is shocking to most people because most people assume that we have, we have some significant um, engagement. And what that has done as well is that has provided us with a level of independence, which we have used at times, as, as people have seen, to even call out and question government. And I, and I think that is, a, is a, a role that I think is particularly unique for Black Opportunity Fund because of the power our organization has, because of the strength of our leadership to be able to speak truth to power, but have the impact to have that speaking resonate and have power. Um, and I and I think that is something that um, uh, is is very different. I mean, we we see black community organizations um, who who make decisions based on advocacy where they will speak based on where their funding is coming from. And I think what has made it that has I made it clear over the last couple of years is that black opportunity fund has it takes very seriously that advocacy role. And that will never change regardless of where our funding comes from, because it is important for us to recognize and acknowledge the power we have um, and the stewardship role to speak on behalf of our of our communities. And we will we will continue to play that role. Exactly. Very good. And um, do you have a set of key priorities in your work right now? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think we have done things in sequence. As I said, we have a very clear strategy that is mapped out over, over 10 years. And we've been very deliberate in the way we have rolled them out. 
So the first priority was setting up a best-in-class governance structure, best-in-class financial controls, best-in-class policy framework, putting together a board and leadership team and staff team that were that are uh, very key in terms of what they were able to bring to the table to implement that. And the reason for that is many Black community organizations, obviously, we have seen um, fail to put um, that kind of governance and, and, and framework in place. And what we do know is Black community organizations, when you do take a leadership role, you are going to be under a level of scrutiny that other organizations are not. So we take that, that role very seriously with a future forward uh, policy framework that now, as I said, um, you know, we think is best in class, um, that right now we have policies and, and a governance framework that we are lending, uh, we're providing as, as samples and, and templates for community organizations that have been around for 30, 40 years um, because of, of the, the level of diligence that we have in place. So we did that first, then we looked at programmatic impl Im implementation um, we recognized during the pandemic that, you know, community members are, are, were drowning. So what we needed to do is we needed to immediately deploy funds, get funds to people, get people out of the water, and then also look at why are they falling into the water in the first place and what are the, the systemic strategies we can put in place. We are not, we have launched our, we got our charitable status, which again was, was a, a key milestone for us to be able to get our charitable status, which we've had, you know, by a year and a half, almost two years now. Uh, and then following that to launch our lending program, which we have done. And then the next stage in that sequence, which we're about to deploy, is that uh, $50 million first fund, a venture capital fund. So interestingly, we have had a commitment from National Bank of $5 million towards our venture capital fund for um, for for almost two years and we haven't called on it because again, we are deploying in sequence. So that kind of patient and diligent approach is incredibly unusual to literally have $5 million waiting for you and say, hang on a minute, we will get to it when we are ready, once we have the structure in place. And we're being very patient because of course, now that we've developed or uh, attained our charitable status, we are now looking at, but what is the best structure that we need to develop for launching a venture capital fund that won't jeopardize our charitable um, status? So those are things that we do. We're very patient in what we do. We're very diligent in what we do. Um, we're very diligent in how we choose and select partners, whether that be um, philanthropy, whether that be corporations, whether that be government. Um, Essentially, we are implementing our vision and we bring them on board to invest in our, our vision. So um, we're in a very unique situation. We're not looking to government, for example, to fund the development of our capacity. We are already developing our capacity. We are looking to them to say, you can be a partner in initiatives that will help you fulfill your objectives as, as a government. So we're looking at everything we do is about equal partnerships. Um, and again, just constantly, constantly engaging with community and, and empowering community. Awesome. Awesome. And how do you feel about the future of impact investing and philanthropy in Canada? I, I think what we're seeing is there's certainly a renaissance of black communities because of this point in time. And there's been a rush to investment uh, in you know, social purpose. And for a period of time, as I said, Black was in season, uh, understanding that that is changing. So that means strategies need to change. It means that things can't be taken advantage. It means that uh, in looking for innovative investment uh, ideas, what we have to look at is, 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 is what is the return? What is the, the ROE that is going to have um, that community impact? Um, so I, I think we're in a we're in a good place. Um, I think in terms of the work that we do, it ticks a lot of the boxes across a number of these continuums. We're engaged in affordable housing discussions um, right across Canada as well, which is an ongoing key issue. Um, the 
um, the, the the lending piece, the finance piece, the investment piece. I think we've, we've essentially created an ecosystem and we're pulling in collaborations and partners. So I think there's a great point in time now um, for significant change. I think what is missing is to ensure that the leadership in these spaces, uh, there is place for black leadership and black empowerment. Because what we've seen, say, with the, a lot of the investments by government over the last little while is, is, as I said, it's not necessarily being invested in black communities. Much of it has been invested through black communities. And I think that is something that we have to be extremely careful of. We're almost at the end of the United Nations decade for people of African descent. But when you look at the investments that have been made and investments that continue to be made, how much of it has gone into infrastructure? None. Um, and you see that when you see these ongoing celebrations and awards, galas of so on, celebrating black excellence, which are all being held in non-black owned spaces, where essentially the profits and the majority of the revenues from these are going into other communities. So these are things that we have to be cognizant of because Money has been has changed hands, but power has not changed hands. So I think that's kind of a lesson that we need to learn, um, that we need to, in our negotiations, um, be looking for more strategically at power and not just money, right? We need money, but we need power. We need access to things like land, right? Where we can make our own investments. We can make the determination. So there's... There's a lot of very broad opportunities that are available, but we need to be very strategic uh, in how we look at them, uh, lest we, we fall into the trap of, uh, again, just being a pass through for money, but that long term sustainability is not achieved. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, we see it with Caravana. We see it with, like you said, these galas. You know, we're not in our own spaces. We're not, we don't have the hotel to house our people that when they come in and enjoy our celebrations and our festivities, you know, we don't have that in order to, you know, really get the full spectrum. So I see exactly what you're saying. It's so important for that. Um, yeah. If I might, Matt, I mean, it's very interesting you bring up Caravana because, I mean, Years ago, I was the head of marketing and sponsorship for Caravana. Mm -hmm. And I was literally able to negotiate, you know, millions of dollars worth of, of potential sponsorship and recognize that the organization was not structured fundamentally to be able to um, take those investments and deploy them. I mean, it's almost impossible to have an event which brings in a million people. Uh, and generates almost a billion dollars in economic um, impact every year and to lose money. Um, but yet Caravana has managed to do that from, you know, around 60 years, which is incredible, right? Um, mm -hmm. So what Caravana should be, and, and originally the intent was that Caravana would be the economic engine that drove the Black and Caribbean community. In fact, that was written into the mandate of Caravana in 1967. And the, as part of the mandate in 1967, the profits from that first festival was supposed to go towards um, purchasing a, um, a, a Black and Caribbean community center. And there was actually the down payment was available. There was a site selected on the CNE grounds in Toronto. Um, and then a community decision was made, no, let's just take that money and reinvest it in next year's festival and down the road, we can do that. And here we are, how many years later, and the community center does not exist. Caravana does not own its own facility. Caravana does not even own its own name. So again, money passing through our community, um, and it's very easy strategically to fix this. It's, it's, it's actually very easier. It's, it's easier to make money on Caravana than it is to lose money on Caravana. But because of that lack of understanding of strategy, uh, we continue to miss opportunities. So true, so true. My goodness, <laughs> we can go on about that one, but we'll go to the next question. <laughs> 
Okay, so what is your ultimate goal at BOF and what does success look like to you and your colleagues? Well, the goal, the goal at Black Opportunity Fund is, uh, again, long-term um, social economic impact. So, for example, I mean, uh, Dennis Mitchell, one of the founders of, of Black Opportunity Fund, who now is on our board, chairs our, our investment committee, one of the things he said is the goal is that his children's children take Black Opportunity Fund for granted because it will always have been there, a source of sustainable funds for black community. Um, so the, the goal is that, that there are sustainable long-term funds, pools available to fund black community uh, innovation and social economic uh, empowerment. That's, that, that's the, ultimate, the ultimate goal. And it must be done in a collaborative way with community. It must be done in a collaborative way with black community-led organizations. Exactly. All right. And are there any elders or ancestors that played a pivotal role in your development? And how important is eldership in your work? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, all the way along, I've, I've, I've mentioned Dudley Laws, I've mentioned Sh Sharona Hall, I've, I've, I've mentioned um, Charles Roach, Darry Mead. These are, are, are individuals, uh, um, uh, Alvin Curley. Um, when I came to Canada um, as, a, as a young man, a recent immigrant, um, they were the champions. They were the ones who were leading the struggle. Um, and I was you know, very humbled to be marching on the street with them. But I, was all, I also was very humbled at the way they engaged with me because they engaged and involved me in the social justice movement. But they also looked while they were mentoring me and guiding me they also looked to me for my guidance to them and what they were and what they were doing we had i remember having many talks with dudley law sitting at his at his office uh, you know and he became a friend as well as a a mentor talking talking um strategy and being out sharing uh stages and spaces with with charles roach and and so on, uh, you know. So there, there's, there's many. Um, you know, my, my, the, the, my guidepost has always been my, my mother, who uh, always, you know, taught me that you stand up um, for what you believe in, no matter what, no matter what the cost. And there was never a time that my mother ever compromised that, uh, regardless of the price. Uh, and 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 I, 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 I saw that. That's that's a model that I grew up with. I think it, it's incredibly important. It's incredibly important that we look to those um, who have paved the way, the Jean Augustines and, and, and so on, um, and, and learn the lessons. I, th I think we have to be very careful because we have this kind of generational divide where you have often young people, uh, a younger generation who figures that everybody who went before them um, doesn't have anything to add. It's all these old ideas and, and we're coming up with stuff that nobody has ever thought of. And then you have on the other side with older generation who dismisses the ideas and the voices of, of, of young people. And it's important that they all work together. I think the analogy I always use is there was a race in the world championships uh, years ago, the four by 100 relay where Jamaica was running, the Jamaican um, men's team with Usain Bolt running the second to last leg and he hands it off to Asafa Powell for the anchor. Asafa Powell took off and Usain Bolt ran all the way with him, yelling in his ear, cheering him on the entire way. Um, and I think that's kind of the analogy for how to hand off a baton. So you don't pass it off and stop running. You pass it on to the next generation and you continue running, cheering. That is your role. That is your responsibility all the way to the end um, because it is, it's, it's a team. Ultimately, it's a team and you're part of the team. Love that analogy. So true. So, so true. Because, you know, also, it's like our ancestors are there, with the, but, you know, cheering us on. We don't even see them, you know, but you feel them. And that's a part of Black culture and, and, and really to get that peace is so important as well because it's very comforting in our community to know that our ancestors are looking at us and saying, cheering us on, you know, so that's a beautiful analogy. And um, 
last thing is, or second to last, what words of wisdom do you have to young leaders emerging in Canada? Um, again, I, I think it is important to, uh, one, be humble. I mean, one of the, the, the key things that I have always done is I, I try to surround myself with people smarter than me and then get out of their way. Um, too often, what we find is, is people uh, get intimidated by people who are, are smart in specific pillars where they feel threatened. Um, I think it is important that, uh, again, you, 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 you have that humility to be a great leader where you empower people. Um, so that, that's first, first and, and foremost. Um, I surround yourself with people who will challenge you. So people who will bring divergent points of view. Again, we have too many leaders who look to surround themselves with people who will endorse their points of view regardless. Um, you know, you have better ideas when you have individuals uh, who are going to challenge you, who are not afraid to challenge you, uh, and will bring a broader range of ideas. You always, you always get further uh, when you do that. So it, again, have that humility to do it. Have the humility also to engage those who have come before you. Get mentorship, right? Look at people who are where you want to be or who have been where you want to be um, and take their advice and be open to receiving it. That's it. And do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action? No, I, I think that the calls to action is that, you know, we, we all need to understand that, that we, we're in this together. We're in this fight together. We need to collaborate. We need to come together as a community. Um, and, and the only way we're gonna go forward is that we, we, we do unite. I think it is far too easy and we see it far too often where, you know, the crumbs are, are sprinkled away of our community and it, it turns into a game of thrones. Um, and, and that just in the long term, that ultimately uh, just does a disservice to us all. So I think it is important to, um, you know, we all need to get out of our own way and understand ultimately what is the goal about and the goal is about community the goal is about community impact and every day we need to be looking at what is it we can do each day to move that forward not how can we move our own personal brand forward not how are we moving our own organization forward but what is our shared vision and and how do we interact together as as community um, and what are the kind of rules of engagement that uh, we need to follow, so we can uh, we can we can really advance our community in in a meaningful, sustainable way. That's it. All right, let's see if I can get on camera just to end uh, end our session here. <laughs> it doesn't clip out on us, but I really want to appreciate you know thank you and appreciate you so much for coming and doing this interview for SETC, and this will. It, it's, it's like the ripple in the water, you know, it will just set precedents all over the world and for years to come, for generations to come, to hear the works that are being done in the community and what still needs to be done, the strategic pathways that we need to take, you know, you're setting the groundwork for all of that and we highly, highly, highly appreciate you. Thank so, um, as we close the way we began this interview by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we are on, we also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So once again, Craig, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and your time. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Take care, dear.